panelists, good afternoon. We will have a conversation on circular economy, and I would like to start describing the challenge we currently have. With the consequence of our actions, which is that we now have a planet that is completely contaminated, the natural ecosystem is completely uh, affected by our actions. The linear economy we're currently in, based on capitalism, is the result uh, of the way we manufacture our products. We extract uh, raw materials, we refine those materials, we fabricate those pieces and we assemble them in the form of product. We use the products and at the end of its uh, life use, the end life of the product, it becomes a residue and all of these facets, we use energy. And it produces carbon dioxide emissions. We produce 2 billion tons of waste every year. And that cycle is repeated every time. For us here, we are here to talk, to bring forth suggestions, things you are already contributing in the development of a more sustainable economy, circular economy. I would like to ask all of you uh, to introduce yourselves. Hello, my name is Irina Reyes, founder of Reversible, with Reversible, which is a platform that supports the transit of uh, companies and people for circular economy through strategies and mainly through education on cultural changes uh, c regarding concerning circular economy. We're based in Chile. Hello everyone, my name is Ricardo Cardona. I belong to Suramericana Insurance Company and I am part of the uh, National Safeguard Organization. We treat uh, vehicles after a very serious uh, collision. Collision. Good morning, Cario Carlos Mario Bernal. In the Chamber of Commerce of Medellin, I work with uh, and developing Habitat Sostenible, a strategy within which there is something called circular economy. And this subject for uh, corporate base is an economical model that needs to be watched uh, in detail because it will affect the uh, corporate base. Thank you. My name is Carlo Monsanto. I am International Director of ILE Ecosystem which is a uh, an educational platform network in which we contribute that way of contributing to economy in a circular manner having bringing educational programs focused on human well-being I would like to ask you, how are you already contributing to circular economy? Two years ago, Colfor was created in Chile, which is the Agency of Economical Development of Chile, which are programs for support of circular uh, programs for innovation. It's in line of support of uh, circular economy and they just approved the first research center 
and development, technological development for circular economy based on mining. And thus government has been promoting some lines of work, but circular economy basically is born out of from productive uh, sectors and from people, from the citizens who are more and more informed, who demand, who search, and look for a more sustainable consumption and therefore traction new ways of consumption and production. This is very much in line with the objective of sustainable development. Now with this panel we're in for water and sustainable development and how they contribute to circular economy, I would like to say that Chile is one of the product most important productive centers and in one of the most productive center, important productive centers is the um, agricultural industry. And that takes up, uh, up to 70% of the water consumption. So one of the challenges in a country is how to use water. How can a service, a smart service, a circular service, and how from circular economy and from this perspective, we can look for answers for better use of this resource, which is so necessary for human life. And that in Chile's case, it's also private, uh, a private asset, not a public asset, which is a change that would need to be done in the legislation of our country. This regarding water, or re regarding the agricultural industry in general, there are different initiatives. Uh, the agro industry is developing its uh, route map for circular economy, very much linked to regenerative energy, how we have circular um, economy strategies that can regenerate the ground, but also one who can capture CO2. Because let's, let us not forget that circular economy is a tool to fight climate change and therefore it is a tool countries have to comply with the uh, agreements we have in CDC and the different agreements uh, with the Paris Accords. Therefore, the way we produce is very relevant and how, uh, how circular economy is a tool of care of the resources who are in true risk and we're destroying. Uh, Chile in May reached its peak uh, load capacity, so we consume the natural resources we need in order to produce and the country the people need in a year. We reached that top in May. This is a characteristic shared with Colombia and other countries in the region. We all have different challenges regarding water, agriculture industry, food industry, and therefore the circular economy and how we develop challenges for this new production system and how we support that beyond recycling but with a larger framework that's the objective we've been working war, war with in reversible with the uh, circular economy platform and this principle of sustainability thank you carlos mario the issue of circular economy and how to promote its implementation we we spring off a basis. There, can, there needs to be a consciousness and awareness on the landscape you just described. A la uh, one, they are being affected by the economical system and production system that is a linear, linear model. I would add oh, everything you said, models who are add the obsolete factor, which, uh, which highlights the problem much more. There needs to be an awareness on the part of every citizen, an awareness that that model is not sustainable over time. And that today in the different parts of uh, the planet, we are living ad ends meet. 
there are some calculations of many hectares for, to know how, how many resources I need to feed, for example, the people in the country. But if you look at that sustainability model, every country is in, in a red balance in that. We would need two and a half planets to sustain our current level of consumption. Second step, so that's the first step. We need to have this awareness, create this awareness. And I think Ellen MacArthur in, uh, in the, his sailboat says, if I run out of water, the closest place to get water to is 6,000 uh, kilometers. So it's closer to actually go to space to get water than the closest place in the planet. This means that the water resource is finite and we need to measure it very well for its use because its subsistence is uh, is dependent on that. So the planet, if we make the analogy, the planet is that sailboat we're all traveling in and there's no other place in the universe so far that we have discovered close by that we can reach where we can get those resources. So one is an awareness. After that, there needs to be a culture. We need to work that culture, generate a culture, not only to have a responsibility, but also to change our consumption habits. And to change those consumption habits is not simple. It will take time. Here we're talking about that this is not a challenge that pertains only to the productive sector, but it, it involves every actor, the productive center, citizens, the state, the state needs to revise itself and rethink itself. We're talking about regulations, every actors, uh, academia, regulators, public, private, citizens, we're all consumers. So first there needs to be an awareness generation and then a culture for a, a responsible consumption. Now, how do we do that? That's where we need to start exploring creative ways of promoting one, this uh, creation of awareness and two, the acquisition of this new culture, one we do not have. That's a challenge. How can we as a community, as a society, develop that consciousness, that awareness? I would say that we would need to uh, deepen in areas such as communication, formation, in turn around all of these topics. We need to be very repetitive in our communication aspect and also have formation, promotion, spreading, generating a conscience. It will generate a citizen with a level of awareness greater than today who will be selective of the, when buying. So he will send a signal from the consumer to production. For example, I can make uh, take a determination that to if I only drink water in uh, containers that are, for example, recyclable and returnable. So this is someone with a with an awareness says I will not ever, not again drink water from a container that is not recyclable and reusable. In England, for example, the milkman is again is again uh, uh, a cultural thing that's that's already uh, that's already coming back because milk is distributed door by door in glass bottles which are returnable. This is uh, responsible consumption habits. That's more or less the idea. Thank you very much. Ricardo from Seguros Colombia insurance company and mainly on the automotive sector. And we know all around the world cities are being filled with uh, cars and the production of cars is each time higher. We're working on how to bring our business model to a model of business economy, of circular economy. What we do is that the vehicles that are insured by the company for total loss coverage, the vehicle suffers uh, a collision and damages. We, we uh, purchase that uh, 
a collision vehicle, we take it to our facilities and we see what we will do with it. First, what we do is we see if the vehicle is uh, repairable, doing costs and seeing if the amount of the reparation is not viable. But if this vehicle, I repair it with uh, used parts, maybe with maybe with a cheaper uh, with cheaper cost we can expand its uh, life use the other is that the vehicle because of its damage it's not repairable all the parts left in the vehicle are reusable or recyclable so what we do at our center is to classify these parts we disassemble the vehicle and its part when no reparation is possible and we classify what can be reused to give it a second life to sell uh, many of these uh, parts to repair vehicles who can be repaired and the rest look at the materials and see how we can make adequate use of them talking about recycling this year we made a consultancy trying to look at a way of moving forward in the circular economy and what we found was that from the de from the design aspect as our colleagues were mentioning what we believe is to be build thing we build things so they come to a quick end discard them and purchase a new one this is what we found today in cars vehicles and vehicle parts are built for them to be for it to be very difficult to be recovered so we're seeking to make uh, strategic alliances with manufacturers to see that if from the beginning of the production chain uh, we can make agreements so that at the end of the chain we can make a, an automotive uh, production that is more circular I would like to make an integration of the consciousness of the group and this conversation. If we need to produce products that are repairable, reusable, updatable, for example, a telephone, to update that phone to its last level in order to replace the battery, replace the chip, the processing chip, etc., on our cell phones. Same with cars, to up make them more updatable using materials that might have several lives. For example, with milk in Europe, when it stops being used and it is distributed, so when we consume milk and we're left with the bottles, those bottles can be reused again and again. They can be cycled back. They can be re returned for very low costs. What about not owning the product, but leasing it or renting it instead? That is part of what circular economy proposes as well. That way we can cycle products and its materials and extend their use cycles using green energy and renewable energy as well and reusing the energy that it's invested in manufacturing of products in different processes as well production processes as well for example manufacturing parts 
and products. generates heat and the heats that it's generated as part of the production process of goods and services can be used in other cycles of production what else do you think can be done from the circular circular economy perspective i think that it's very important to understand that there's there's some basic principles the most important principle is that we we have only one earth and the earth has limited resources and that countries in america from S south america most southern countries in america are heavily based on being primary e extractors of um, primary materials we're not giving added value to these materials and on the other hand we're also disposing of everything in landfills because recycling rates in Chile, for example, are very, very low. We can never forget that landfills emit greenhouse gases. And therefore, they create climate change. Climate change, it's also very important for us to understand that fighting climate change is also fighting for social and civil rights because climate change is also highly unequal and equitative because those that create most emissions are compensated by the little emissions of everyone else therefore there are financial there are citizen citizen movements where they they make a call to think not only uh, technically but socially as well and regulations need to advance in that direction and as Carlos mentioned regulations have to uh, uh, advance that way so the, the first principle we need to understand is that we only have one earth the second thing we need to understand is for us to start talking about material and material matrices that are clean we cannot increase our carbon footprint unless unless we talk about circular energy. We need to move towards material matrices that are safe. In Chile, we have one of the most unhospitable districts in the world, and we have the ability to use that as a resource. We also need to use it as a resource, thinking about what are we going to do with those solar panels once they complete their life cycle or those windmills that we might use to produce green energy. So underlying circular economy, there's a principle about eco design eco design is designing things looking at nature and how do we design thinking about how we're going to recover the th materials that we invest in the products that's why what what they mentioned in the previous session and inspiring yourself in nature is very important nature fosters cooperation nature fosters cyclic use of materials nature favors sharing and there is no waste in nature and that's what we have to learn from we produce huge amounts of, of waste in chile municipalities have to take care of this materials this waste if we want rights as citizens we also have duties and we need to take responsibility for the waste and i would like to highlight that is an important part and how can we raise awareness as well in individuals where well, we're lucky that uh, new generations are kind of upgraded in their AD, uh, DNA and they're very environmentally concerned it's kind of embedded in their DNA and there's lots of uh, awareness raising about climate change and there are two things that are important this you're talking about dematerializing these are new business models for a new business model to be a reality, we need new entrepreneurs. So having kids learn about sustainability and entrepreneurship and seeing them as two things that are not separate is very important. Therefore, training from a very early age and training through practical experiences is very important for a generational change. 
And there are these educational programs. Yes, in Chile, we do have high schools to do it, but there's also been um, a curriculum change to incorporate climate change as one of the mandatory subjects in universities. We we're pushing uh, programming agenda and the ecology agenda as well, because programming is very important as well. The digital model is, is very important. I, I feel that I belong to a different generation, one that has very thick and uh, stupid thumbs. Now, being a user of a phone is not the same as being a programmer, but being a user, we need to take responsibility for the end of life of, uh, of this, cell phones where there's more cadmium palladium and many other toxic metals in a ton of electric waste than in any other type of waste i'm complete i completely agree i once read a book that said that the biggest coal copper mines are not in chile but uh, under washington and cities like that i would say that raising awareness has to do with becoming aware of things that affect you directly. It will affect us economically, socially, and environmentally. If I take those three things into account, there's a specific result, which is less quality of life. If I have a, a business that deteriorates natural resources, it will affect my own quality of life. Many cities and many societies around the world are living that problem right now. In Colombia, there are big cities that are dealing with this, where you might have to spend two hours a day in traffic to get to your house. So that creates a lot of inconformity, and we need to understand what's happening. This week, we had a manifestation in Germany. People who were, um, these were agriculturists, and they went and parked their tractors in downtown Berlin, if you go to and Google it, you'll, you'll see it. They're, what are they requesting from the government? They're, Germany has this regulation uh, about CO2 emissions, which is far more stringent than most countries. So it becomes very demanding for uh, uh, farm owners and agriculturers uh, in Germany than in Colombia, for example. People in Colombia can uh, produce far more CO2 emissions here than in Germany. So those economic differences are going to start uh, creating. So the result is that eventually it will balance out. So our agricultures and agri agriculture in America will have the same regulations. They, they still don't, don't have those stringent regulations that they have in, in, in Germany, but it will come and it will affect their income that's when the problem becomes a reality and stops being subjective. So the same thing happens when I live, for example, in this valley where Medellin is, we have a poor quality of, of the air in two times a year. Citizens in this valley are very aware that uh, uh, of air quality because we've, we have to suffer that difficulty. So what I'm saying is that this is gonna start happening all over. Governments have to be aware of this social dynamics, this inconformity. This requires changes in production systems and it demands changes in the regulations as well. And we need to understand what people are complaining about. How can we support this? With this type of events, for example, we're supporting it. We create culture, we raise awareness. There's no doubt in my mind that Irina will publish something in her website related to the discussion we're having right now. This is how we support locally and internationally this huge effort that we need to participate in, in raising awareness. And I believe that right now we have a huge advantage, which is communication and social networks. Just as social networks help to promote those worldwide upheavals and manifestations, Many good things can be done through social networks. Thanks to the communication technologies, we can also use this to 
raise awareness and share information. Carlos mentioned something which is very important, which is I think we need to change business models. One thing is eco design, thinking about how we design the materials and how we're going to re recover them, but also the way in which we consume. You mentioned earlier about products as services. I work for the automotive industry. There's a there's this whole movement worldwide where people don't own their vehicles anymore, they lease them. I don't have to, I could do a little bit of car sharing, for example, through, a, through an app, through a platform or a mobile phone, and I can do, you know, do my commute with another five people and we don't have to have five more cars running around in the streets. All of a sudden we don't have to own this huge pickup here in Medellin, we love big cars, but instead I can, I have the alternative of a scooter or a public bicycle enabling me to get to the same place much faster because traffic jams here are becoming a real problem. So we need to rethink the way in which we consume products and that applies at many different levels, not only for mobility. We buy things for a house, for example. I need to make a, make, make, dig a hole in a wall, I buy a drill and then don't use it for 10 years, right? So, so instead of buying it, why don't I lease the drill, install my, my blinds and then lease the drill online for it to be used for, by other 1000 people, for example. I would like to highlight that position in two ways. Awareness in consumption, which Ricardo just mentioned, don't buy a drill just to install a set of blinds. So I agree with that. I believe that we can change many, many habits we have. You can start with yourself. And the second element that I believe is very powerful, you mentioned it, is business models. Related to mobility, automotive mobility, I don't need to own a vehicle. I can lease it for move it to move from A to B within the city. I visited Suda this week where I saw this. This allows us, for example, Suda can offer new types of insurance because now I'm going to use my vehicle only two, two hours a day. It's not mine. So I need a, a, an insurance that will protect me within that time frame. So that's a new business model for them. There are two new business models in this scenario. The vehicle itself, I don't own it anymore. And second, the insurance, two different business models. And there's also uh, change in my consumption habits. I'm not the owner. I don't have to park my car. And to add to what Carlo mentioned that he, we've always known about car insurance, right? You're insuring basically the object that takes you from A to B. Now Suda is not, it has new insurance policies and they're actually changing the language they use. They don't, they don't call it car insurance, but mobility insurance instead. And I'm insuring the mobility of the person, not the vehicle itself. So I don't insure, let's say you buy a car, you can insure the car, right, to share risks. But also if you move around using Metro or if you move around using a bus or using a scutter, I can also insure your mobility. Right, so Suda is changing the way it thinks in its its own business model. Yeah, the culture needs to change, and the consumer needs to change. When we look at a consumer, I look at people uh, of ages ranging from twenty to thirty years, let's say. Relatively young people, I would say. How can we raise awareness? You already talked a little bit about this, Ricardo. You mentioned uh, social networks as, a, as an outlet through which we can both complain and learn and transfer knowledge to raise awareness. How else would you say we can change the consumer and how we can change the way we think ourselves, not only for young consumers, but 
at any age. I believe that this is a process, this is a transition into circular economy. There's a stock of products and services that were created within a linear model and we're transitioning therefore to a circular one. I believe that there, there was a year which was a turning point And a number of things happened in 2015 where we changed, where we had the Kyoto Protocol. We moved from that to the Paris Agreement where the church uh, published its uh, encyclica saying that regardless of your creed, made a letter saying, let's take care of this, our land, which is yours and mine, regardless of your creed. And we also have the sustainable development agreements. Everything happened in 2015. These sustainment development agreements that are talking to us about the female inclusion, gender equality, about sustainable development, about sustainable production and consumption. And they also talk about intelligent cities that are both resilient and safe. I believe that all those things that have been incorporated into the, both the public agenda and the civil agenda have achieved with this movement we are creating in a way the perfect storm for things to happen so that a transition towards a more sustainable model will happen I will be forced by the conditions and what's happening in Latin America, all these national civil revolts in one way or another is showing that we are aligning ourselves towards a, a more empathetic model, let's say. We are all human beings. We are also the biggest depredators. We dip, we destroy our own, our, our own earth. I would say, in fact, that as a species, we are probably the worst. <laughs> We're kind of a virus, let's say. We're not the best species because we don't know how to work with nature. And we just heard in the last panel that uh, nature is capable of taking care of itself. It has been doing so for 3.8 billion years and we, we haven't been able to do that, we don't. So this production model, this new production model requires collaboration and Part of that collaboration would be industrial symbiosis. In industrial symbiosis is a production model that is being applied in Holland and in other European countries where groups of companies, SME companies, create clusters to be able to use disposable materials from one industry as raw materials for other product production cycles. And there, in industrial symbiosis, there's a chance or an opportunity to use many other materials that we, that we discussed earlier. There, in industrial symbiosis, there are opportunities for cooperation, op opportunities for textile industry and chamber of commerces in all of our countries. What I see and what I hear from you is a, a, is a call for a transition into a more sustainable model, top to bottom, let's say, with, a, with an approach top to bottom. Yes, but how can we then raise awareness at the base of the pyramid, the individual? Because our awareness and self-awareness, in a way, emerges. It cannot be controlled from the top. Learning is something that, that is a result of the cooperation with other people. So, how do you solve that equation? Circular economy is especially appropriate for crisis uh, moments. Carlos mentioned uh, the example of the milkman. I believe that there is no better circular economist than my mother who had to raise my family in South America and Chile in the 70s 
where even my brother, my male brother, had to reuse our underwear. And back then, we used we used to buy things. Um, We had to buy things by reusing, uh, packing. We used to go and buy things um, in bulk. So basically, consumers have changed and the industry has also changed because at the end, living with less resources makes you more creative and more resilient. Forces you to look for more opportunities to become sustainable. That's why countries, developing countries are in a way more sustainable than developed countries because we don't have those huge uh, supermarkets like bj or Costco. when you go to the united states and go to these supermarkets it's it's really breathtaking but on the other hand you have lots of things that you don't use and you don't need and you can do without how do you foster an agenda of education and awareness raising here in colombia carlos i'm very optimistic on this respect because I believe that we are being able to train our youth and very well. I have a, an 11-year-old kid and he's actually teaching me how to recycle and he he forces me to be aware. Whenever we go out to a restaurant, he's saying to me, Dad, please don't ask for a straw. You're just going to throw it away or don't let them use a disposable cup. And I believe that culture is being... Um, spread throughout youth so i would say that it's our our generation is the problem we have been brought up in a different in a different system back in the 70s we had kind of like naturally a circular economy within the household and then we were we witnessed the industrialization era and uh, disposable product became a thing it's just the convenience of it i don't have to store it i don't have to clean it and then changing our habits the habits of our generations let's say 40 years and older might be a little bit more difficult so we have to find ways to unlearn and relearn so the younger generations are already adopting the tendencies i would say I mean, they pick it up at school, would you say? Or would you say they pick it up through the social networks? I believe that it's everywhere. The TV, social networks, they're picking up uh, you know, environmental conscious in the, in the schools. We have recycling programs at the, at the school level and fostering reuse and recycle and reduce. All, all media really is kind of sending the same some idea promoting the idea of uh, being environmentally aware so the question is how to create that uh, environmentally con environmental consciousness and that culture i would say that we would have to use many different uh, outlets many different uh, social media and then repetition and repetition this will take time there's this global forum for the development of circular development uh, global forum for the development of circular economy is trying to develop circular economy principles which is um, organized by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation they talk about taking your time spending about five years in fostering awareness to create a culture if I had to create awareness in eco design or if I had to talk about industrial design if I made a call for companies to come to teach them about it, I would only get uh, you know three or four or five companies showing up. Let's say that we are privileged to be part of a group that are people that have been exposed to these topics. We're not experts, but we are aware, more aware than most people. So if I today call uh, an entrepreneur to tell him, hey, why, why don't you change the way you do things and uh, incorporate eco design principles it wouldn't be easy for them to accept it and for the market it's also very difficult uh, 
So I would say that it's important to allow yourself a time frame to create culture first. And that in that phase, you need to address many different publics and many different sectors of the population and you, each one might have a different strategy so you need to have strategies for kids at schools you need to have strategies for older people you need to have ways of creating new habits and raising awareness we might also simply ask apartments in colombia have a small storage uh, space usually in the first floor uh, of the building where you store things that you don't use that much throughout the year for example uh, the Christmas tree, for example. We could try to look there into the storage room and see how many things we haven't used in the last three years. This is all stuff that has a footprint, carbon footprint, and you're not using, right? So basically, change starts within. Try not to buy things that you don't use. That would, I would say that's the way we make changes. So how do we foster that? We create training spaces, spaces that foster this culture, and through repetition. And that way, slowly, you start building awareness and, and culture around the topic of the environment. Talking about the business sector and capitalism, capitalism has good things. It helps us have living standards that are amazing and uh, helps us grow financially as well. And companies are always trying to improve their profit. So an important thing in circular economy is to show that business models in circular economy are also profitable. When you show that to a company, when you show that it's, this is much more than just taking care of our, of our country and saving our resources, saving our earth, they're first concerned about their profitability. If I prove to an entrepreneur that transitioning into a circular model is not is profitable, but it's also environmentally friendly, they would be much more open-minded and uh, much more accepting of these ideas. So for the business sector, we definitely need to demonstrate that this business model is not only profitable, but sustainable over time. Also, that it's a new it, it, it's a new way of thinking so we'll have lots of new business opportunities how could we how would it be if businesses and schools adopt the circular um, economy model how would our reality look if they all suddenly adopted it Well, how would, let me see if I understand. Carlos can tell us about it. Okay, that scenario, for those of us that are transitioning into a circular model, we will already see where we need to head to. We need to see which areas or which industrial sectors haven't bought into the idea. Maybe we're here in a forum or in an initiative of one specific industry, but when I go out there and the only offer I find in my reality is disposable products all over, my cup, my dish, my napkin, we are surrounded by a world that is linear, so it becomes very difficult for me as an individual to take that step. So I believe we need to make a call on all different areas of life uh, at a, a family level, the household level, the school and the individual, or also the industry. And uh, for example, like selling milk in a glass container again, or so that we can, we can all be parti participate in whatever we learn, we can actually take, take to action because it's useless for me to change my my paradigm if I don't have an industry that allows me to implement those ideas the products that I am forced to buy have to be have components that have to be wasted 
So I believe that we all need to pitch in to be able to achieve a society where from, from the industry and from a consumption standpoint of view, we can implement circular economy all over. I would like to expand one of the things that we mentioned about capitalism. I don't think there is a separation between capitalism and socialism. It's more a separation between linear economy and circular economy. It's not socialism or capitalism, it's linear economy, economy that it takes, uses, and wastes, versus an economy that is capable of using materials where we can measure the flow of materials and recover them. And therefore, for new companies, it's very easy for you if you start as a circular company. The problem is when you are already a company that has been established linearly and you have to transform your value chain into a circular value chain. And therefore, you have to change your supply chain. You have to start using recycling and reusing, which is one of, one of the main things in circular economy. Because if you go to the Helen MacArthur um, diagrams and the Burfield diagram, which is we have to start on the most basic things. Recycling is one of those first steps. It's not enough. It's the least, it's less bad, but it is a step. And I'm, I'm really fascinated by what I've seen here in Medellin. You have recycling uh, stations and hubs, and you, they're very organized here. The, the Botanical Garden has a recycling program as well. Space where everything is thought, thought of through. I was seeing the news yesterday in local news newscast, and uh, they were also talking about the things that, that are missing. And now to talk a little bit more about the circular value chain. How, how do we use platforms of shared services? And how do we use the industrial symbiosis? Going back to the idea that uh, how, for example, organic waste in the food industry can be reused for the dairy industry or the agricultural industry as inputs. I believe that's a, a challenge for the industry, but there are companies like Patagonia who are transforming their business models. And there are many other um, business model examples. Perform, uh, uh, a Dutch company, a cell phone company. In Chile, we have other successful cases like Cumberplast, which recovers plastics. We also have an industry, uh, salmon industry, which is very well developed. That generates lots of, well, that uses lots of plastics, but they're recovered to create pellets. So basically, we also have industries that uh, reuse plastics, and there's this global movement kind of calling on the industry to develop options that uh, remove plastic from their value change and their supply chain uh, to transfer to, to move it into a more circular model and what relationship do would you say what relationship would you say that sustainable energy has where you see there are more manufacturers of electric cars etc how do you relate this? How do you make the relationship between those ways of generating energy, more renewable energy, and the use of electric cars in circular economy? How do you relate all of these renewable energies in circular economy with new electric cars for example so here we go into the aspect of energy in technology so energy i can insert it in a in a technologies center and within technologies and sector and energy specifically we would have to talk about energies of free of uh, clean sources it is key in any production process, and it needs to comply with three criteria. It needs to be abundant, clean, and cheap. Those three criteria must 
uh, be complied by energy and those two need to be renewable energies obtained through those energies obtained by fossil um, energies fossil fuels do not comply with any of those three so we know fossils are not uh, are not viable a viable road but if i join it with biological uh, technologies if i combine energy and biological technology i must reset the whole concept of home services from the technological perspectives the models for uh, residual management from homes for example uh, sanitary uh, treatments that we have today are very obsolete and generate a lot of impacts but it turns out that technologies to substitute those obsolete models are already invented we need to know them generate a culture around them for people to know them and so that from the final user uh, can, must that demand come can you give an example of that uh, way of technology I knew some of them for example some of them use uh, pneumatic systems they have a great control of uh, of the odors and they are compacting plants that make a separation and a better disposition of all these uh, wastes I can make combustion there is a lot of biological technology and energy recovery technologies aside from the prior separation which this demands the incorporation to biological cycles and everything that's organic load because what I'm doing is burying organic uh, load and I am uh, I am condemning it I'm um, I'm generating great impact with metals and and different materials that I'm putting on the earth and behind this challenge what we have are great opportunities for new businesses the aspect of energy uh, sets something similar for example vehicles I believe that vehicle car manufacturers need to open their perspective because the model will change the habit consumption will change maybe in the future I will not want to purchase my car maybe I have the last model I purchased and I don't think I will uh, buy another uh, another gas engine car I'll wait for an electric car uh, to come out but maybe I don't even want to purchase it maybe in the future people will rent car or rent uh, for example skate uh, mono skateboard type vehicles for short distances and this culture is already changing consumers who already knows it exists and fortunately some companies are already thinking in that new habit and that new consumption and they're generating offer so already have an offer of electric cars I have offers for or for insurance services who will cover the mobility of the citizen and not the car itself so if I were a car manufacturer I would be worried I would be reviewing that because this is already changing this is not a, f a future down the line this is a very uh, short-term future I know some car manufacturers who are already thinking on that they are considering it seriously considering it I will complement what Carlos is saying a bit on electric mobility there are two things we need to keep in mind there one is the tendency for electric cars is that there are zero emissions but I have to look at where I'm charging the car with that the energy I'm loading it with is that the, it, it is a clean energy if it's thermoelectric energy I must say well how efficient am I being with an electric car and the other thing is think what we will do with those batteries that we today's technology are still considered of a short shelf life we are developing a, a research with the university with the UPV University in Medellin 
regarding vehicles, I would say not in the future because it's uh, v because electric cars are already uh, in use. What will happen with those batteries, for example, with a car who went on an accident that's non-recoverable? The battery is unusable at 70, 80 percent of its use. Uh, at a car accident, for example, so it has still has a lot of shelf life. So once once the shelf life is over, what will we do with it? How will we expand that shelf life? For example, energy, energy for home, photovoltaic energy. I will uh, I will store them in the uh, second extended life of a battery life. Then that will be a reuse and once it's at a 10 percent then it's then it's done so how will we do mining with the elements of those batteries there are many many rich materials in there that would be great for mining when it's no longer usable uh, as a battery for example there are many papers on transportation and and one was on for example on electric scooters and saying that um, electrical scooters are not necessarily more sustainable than a regular scooter but it has to do with the shelf life of them so it's also the responsibility of manufacturers and governments to look at those types of initiatives but in this in this setting, there's an unsuspected opportunity to make a sustainable use and environmentally responsible in all of our countries. I say this from the perspective of Chile, when there's a low added cost for materials who are extracted and exported. So there is a very large gap in Chile. There's a spending of $0.5 per extracted material. So there is room for research and when I say research, I mean R&D and applied to companies where universities and companies join to look for technological developments. There are programs who have uh, leaned against uh, uh, transportation analysis reports but they are quite isolated. I believe academia here has also a relevant role. Talking not only for the development of papers, for the issue of papers, but also academia in applied research. The space uh, between electrical vehicles, the use of hydrogen as a new source of energy, lithium, as a uh, nuclear fusion. In Chile, we have a large quantity of volcanoes, so geothermal energy. There's a lot of clean energies we need to explore that could be ex jointly explored. You mentioned hydrogen as a new source for electric vehicles as well, right? What do you think about that, Ricardo? I heard and I read that lithium as a as a matter that lithium as matter in order to extract it generates a lot of pollution. What do you know about that? Hydrogen technology is very well tested. Research has been going on for a long time. We know it's clean technology because what, what comes out of the uh, pipe is pure water. The, what's difficult is to capture hydrogen and the separation of molecules found in nature. I think that's what has rendered difficult for it to be imposed as technology into the future in electric mobility. This is why lithium was uh, more weight, because with the elements we've, 
we're manufacturing today are still abundant on the earth. But this is a very close-sighted, near-sighted uh, site. But uh, how will we be in 100, 100 years from now? And even what damage am I uh, inflicting in the earth when I'm extracting these materials? So I believe it is very important to continue developing. And I know very developed countries such as uh, Germany, the United States have been working very firmly in hydrogen cells to produce mobility with these types of technologies. I believe it's a path we need to continue exploring because as Carlos was saying, one of the parameters is abundance and inexpensive. Once we find the way of making that separation in an inexpensive way, it is very it would be very viable. What I want to know though is how you relate that production of electric cars with circular economy. How does that relate with circular economy? Yes, the reuse. Yes, uh, what I was uh, telling you that we're working with uh, the UPV University today, electric cars today are still not built under a new circular economy model. Also, the manufacturers themselves don't know what to do with the batteries. This is a problem we have today. The issue is not solved. The electric cars today, as they're built in the market, are not under a uh, circular economy model. And we are then forced to research how to incorporate these vehicles into a circular economy. In my perspective, because they're new technologies from design, they should be designed under a circular economy model. Sadly, they're not. So they're still a long ways out. So because it's, it, it's sad to see that it's a new technology still in development and we're not thinking about uh, making it part of the circular economy model because the battery is a key part of, elect of uh, elect an electric vehicle and it's very dangerous in itself and we're not considering how to uh, make better use of it. This implies we must move from lithium as a raw matter, raw material to another matter, very possibly. That transition that we need, yes. Because the technology exists you can have a car that mobilizes with energy based on hydro technology. Thank you. Now, what are the next steps we need to take? We have thought a lot about that, but what are the suggestions, the next steps? At a global level, it is important for us to have a common ground out of which to spring forth. We need to um, look at the first ISO regulation on circular economy, where different countries need to have a consensus on what we understand by circular economy because by that some may understand that it is not related to the use of clean energies or knowing that it is regenerative some are just some just stay in the recycling economy so we need to have a common definition and principles of circular economy another important aspect are the circular business models and this is another cha chapter of the the ISO norm, what are the business variables they incorporate? They will only talk, uh, we will only talk of circular uh, models when we talk about a triple impact projects or in the value proposal of the business. We have businesses dedicated to triple impact, social, environmental, and economically sustainable or business models where we incorporate the environmental aspects as part of the measurement. So from that perspective, it becomes very relevant because one, 
we standardize what uh, circular economy means. Two, circular business models. And three, indicators for, circu for that circular motion metrics. When we look at the uh, circular economy and in order we are measuring it, we're measuring the flux of materials, we're looking at waste and recovery. The European Union has already uh, come up with guidelines to advance in this sense and countries in Europe and other countries in the world such as Japan, even China has a strategy of circular economy. They want to be the circular economy empire and they have their own roadmaps and in the region we're also walking in that process. And to wrap up with this regulation aspect at a global level, we are developing this first uh, ISO regulation for circular economy. It will be done first semester next year. We're already in the final meetings in each of the subgroups. This regarding a normalization, normalization for the industry, but in the region, many countries are developing the circular, circular economy roadmaps. Because of the circular economy platform and SDF, we're working for CTCN and for UNIDO in the diagnosis of circular economy in four countries. We have to work in Chile and other members of the platform who will always attend the forum who are working in Brazil, in Mexico and Uruguay. So we're looking at where each country is because sometimes there are initiatives on circularity and the industry itself uh, don't know what it's been done in the sense. And this roadmap for the relevant countries to establish what the industries will be, which have more circular uh, potential, which are the small industries who have the potential for circular uh, circular potential. One of the methodologies of uh, Helen MacArthur, right? How to measure these industries and the importance of production. In Chile, we are a country that is very long and narrow. We have a linear condition. So to go from this linear condition to a circular condition is a great challenge from the inverse logistics perspective because it implies a lot of collaboration to apply circular business models in recollection of materials in the pro or in production itself. So in that, the next steps in uh, Chile are to continue bringing out incentives on the um, Economical Development Agency in business models and in circular entrepreneur projects. And now from the third sector also promote the sustainable consumption. Within Chile, we were the first uh, leaders and first organization of circular uh, consumers. It is very important for, for there to be consumers who demand of the industry a step further. When could we, when could we receive the ISO regulation? That would depend on the standardization agency, but they're talking about first semester 2020. Currently I'm working in groups one and three. Group one talks about indicators, I'm sorry, definition, and we're in the final work. It is not easy to agree because we're over 20 countries and representatives in the group out of which our active representatives in the meeting would be from the 20 around six. But you have Europe, South America, Namibia, different representatives from different countries in this. So it's not easy. But then there's a group who works with such as every other ISO, um, regulation a norm they work with the 2020 vision are there also conversations with the different ministries such as ministry of education for example 
on how to pr uh, facilitate programs for education. The fact that Chile is still leading the COP25 because of the fact that it's not done in Santiago or Chile even, doesn't mean they're not uh, leading it. For example, next uh, Monday it will be in Madrid, but Chile still has the residence. And the development of the COP25, everything will be around that. So there was a lot of educational development the COP25 team was able to coordinate different political sectors and also from civil society. Groups have been created for conversation and embassies. Embassies of countries belonging to the European Union are also creating spaces for conversation that have been halted due to certain situations, but as an important space for conversation has been created and we hope that it will be re-engaged because as I said at the beginning of the conversation, climate change is indeed a space for, it generates a space of inequality that is uh, tremendous between those who, uh, emit and those who don't. So we are in public consultation. Our collaboration, our collaboration with the Paris Accord that has a different component this year, aside from mitigation, commitment, and commitment on emission, there are two parallel lines one of them is circular economy commitment in the country through the paris accord developing the instrument of a circular economy carlos thank you very much carlos mario uh, your turn could you please repeat the question the next steps i would say that in order to mention the next steps i will make a brief uh, summary on what the steps are that we need to take. Elena touched on one we hadn't touched, which are the standards. Standards allow me to parallel the language and make it equal everywhere. We need to understand each other. There's the terminology that needs to be validated for technologies, for actors, and the standards allow for this. So we had talked about culture of public and consumer in general and your awareness around consumption. We talk about a responsible consumption. Don't purchase something you don't need. Don't do that. And if you will buy it, purchase it with a sustainable uh, concept. The consumer needs to be, have clarity in those concepts for to know how to make a choice when the time of purchasing. When I generate that, cult, that awareness and that culture, the consumer will make different decisions. He will take different decisions and this will send an important, important weight information to the private sector. Then we talked about use of technology. There's digital, biological, and physical use of technology. Then we're talking about standards. This is important because that will validate language and this will uh, give us the tools we need. We talk about the spreading of different uh, model, business models. We're talking about models that will have changes in standards of technology based on a new awareness and new, and new business model. The uh, game rules of the game will change. And we will have, for example, on not only being, not only owning the good, but also 
be an asset owner of that good, but that will redefine technology. It will redefine how we design and how we acquire this product. So there are many phases. There's technology, there are standards, there are business models, there are processes associated with the productive model. We were talking about eco design, eco innovation. We're talking about industrial symbio symbiosis. And for industries, it's a process to review manufacturing processes. We agree so far? Okay. So there are a large quantity of phases. I would start on the first one as the next step to create an awareness and create culture. My efforts right now are geared towards that. But in that culture creation, I need to talk to them about all of those components because that's where, where society and market is gearing to. So for me, the next two, three years, the purpose will be to make particular emphasis in the generation of culture, in gatherings with different actors, in all of these matters. I would talk a bit on the corporate sector. We must understand the tendencies in terms of sustainable economy, understanding where we're headed, what the risks are, because it's not only I'm contaminating, I'm polluting the planet, but based on that, I'm finishing companies. And if I'm not able to read tendencies on where we're headed and I don't adapt to that new business model, which we think is unstoppable, then the company will eventually close and be left outside. It will be left out. As Irina says that she was saying from Chile, how do we accompany the uh, regulators, the government, the regulating entities? Because from the regulation aspect, there are a lot of limitations to develop initiatives. I think that it is important to have focus on governments and for them to focus from their action plan to help develop these new surging models. One example to close the models of uh, mobility as services opened. There was, for example, KV5, and there's a platform that really helps me a lot to make mobility more efficient. It is very difficult for me to come to a country for regulation issues. And we're sometimes very slow to adapt the regulations of the country to those new models that are arriving. So from the models, react to those businesses, these tendencies to facilitate these new circular business models. Thank you very much. Now, so far we've heard a lot on regulations, norms, organization at, at corporate levels. And I am a man of l learning. I always want to bring that new model of how to embrace circular thinking. How can we bring those very valuable ideas to the individual, to the student, to the consumer, so that he can grow, become a better human being, a critical thinking human being, somebody who thinks in a circular way. How to bring that upgrade of the mind, let's say, to schools. There has to be schools that want to embrace these concepts in their own context so that their, their students can 
become familiar and grow in an environment that is actually already designed in a circular way. What do you guys think about this? In case of Chile, there is a program that uh, has been running for the last few governments, which is a certification, um, environmental certification for schools. One is run by the Municipal Environmental Authority, uh, another one for smaller schools. The certification has three levels from basic to advanced, and then you have to update that certification. What they measure is three or four things where the most important thing is how do you incorporate this information into your curriculum and the study plans? How do you incorporate environmental um, concepts? And then they also measure how do they manage their waste. It's also important for kids to to learn to recycle at school and how the support they get um, outside of the school scenario. Places like this, like this botanical garden. In the southern part of Chile, we do have places like this botanical garden, but uh, visiting places like this also for people to get fall in love with nature, and that has been important for for certain schools and uh, also for companies that have developed. Um, around this certification there's this company called uh, that basically devotes his efforts to environmental education about recycling uh, teaching people how to separate resource um, waste how to reuse and how you rethink the model so we've been working on on, on that for about eight or nine years in Chile regarding education, environmental education. At the university level, in different programs, in Universidad de Bello, they have a program, uh, an undergraduate program, that are related to um, conservation of biodiversity. There are also programs of human capital development. Uh, Corpo, this company that I mentioned, they have programs to develop a cap human capital and eco design as well, and a circular economy. I think that we are also promoting that from from public funding as well, both from from schools to higher education. Conicid is another agency that supports research which has doctorate and postdoctorate fellowships where they they have have some priority projects that have to do with training doctorate and postdoctorate students uh, in topics regarding sustainability and climate change so with their initiatives thank you very much what about colombia i'll talk about the scenario where i move I move around the corporate world where, where there's this group of companies where are hearing about this tendency that will affect us, circular economy. And the question is not if it's going to affect us, but when is it going to affect us? One of the main challenges we have is training our human capital. So in the corporate world, I talk about training of human capital associated with productive processes in, in companies. So we, we have to raise questions like, who do we have to train and what's the purpose of their training? It's not a simple question to answer. That's why I'm so interested in the ISO standard when I use the standard with digital tools. It kind of gives me clarity about what are the training contents uh, of, of these programs. Right now, we have lots of tools and lots of models. For example, we could talk about eco-design and symbiosis. And if I add technology to those business models, so the, the question I'm answering is, who do I teach 
what do I teach him? For example, for a, for a company that produces cars, what is the kind of content that I need to teach at the managing level, at the manufacturing level, at the executive level? So at the managing level, in the production phases of a vehicle, I have many different phases. There's a conceptualizing phase, a design phase, logistics, commercial, uh, marketing, just to mention a few. So in each of those phases, of, we have different employees and what are the what are the training needs of them that's our first challenge to define those so we also need to call for the public sector to help us also need to promote initiatives that are trying to create standards let's say those are the challenges that we have those are the challenges that we'll face once we foster culture it won't be easy for me to call somebody to be trained in all these topics if I haven't first fostered culture. First, I need to create culture for people to be willing to be trained in these subjects. So I think we're going to close this panel. No, we're going to continue. Ricardo. Would you guys like to have some water or does anyone need anything else? I would like some water, please. I don't move around the educational world or the academia world. I'm not very familiar with the projects, uh, educational projects that are being um, run in Colombia. I definitely think that we need to start uh, at young ages teaching them how the world is meant to work securely. When I teach young minds that the world is meant to be used in a circular way, he will grow to be a circular consumer. I believe when to start at the base with the kids, we are working along the system that has been established for us and a status quo of the economic model that has been in place for many, many years, and we're trying to offset the, the damages that we have caused. But as, along that, we also need to teach the young ones how to re-understand how the world ecosystem works. So that transfers to the way he lives his life or the way he consumes products. We need to go back to the basics as far as education goes. I would like to add something there because what Ricardo mentions is very inspirational. Let's say you take some kids to the local forest and you show them that there everything is orderly. There is no waste and that is a spontaneous natural process. But when I bring them back to society, none of that happens. So we need to mimic our behaviors to align them with nature's behaviors. And I would say that I agree, we need to start with the kids. In my own trainings, I always emphasize that uh, your behavior and the results of that behavior translates to your emotions, whether or not you feel happy or not so your behavior also reflects your inner world my behavior enable a physical or emotional balance or help you achieve that balance self-knowledge as well what i see in the educational system is that it's a bit linear in the way it teaches. Would you? S that is changing when we introduce the social part of education and the emotional part of education, which connects students with their inner reality. that connection and interconnection of the 
between the external learning and the internal learning is a very important element to help individuals recover their ability to, to think circularly. And also be aware of how their their actions, their emotions affect the environment. I, th I would think that should also be part of how do we teach people, not only our young ones, our kids, but older people and our adults as well. In a way, we want to heal the Earth. We want to heal our planet. But to do that, we need to heal ourselves first, to some extent, through self-knowledge. What else would you say we are missing? I would say we have a lot of things to do. Especially considering our current situation. South America, it's in upheaval in a way. We cannot abandon the social processes or the social problems that we have. We're talking about how to introduce ecology and environmental consciousness into the con in, into the education but we also have to deal with very different um, educational levels amongst our people we do have an advantage learning about take care of the environment can be learned by doing learning to care is intuitive but we also have a disadvantage which is we're very we're, we're not very empathic empathetic and empathy is one of the fundamental elements of this business model, this economic model. And in this revolution, this transition toward circular economy, take into account elements like governance, technology, or, or market failures, and the recovery of the environment are very important. When I talk about governance, to be able to establish circular economy models, we need to have information about material flow. And I would say we're lacking that information currently. It's not centralized, it's decoupled. I believe that the quality of the information uh, that we generate as countries to be able to measure material flow to be able to have a baseline and to be able to measure our progress as well. We could also talk about training the public sector of different public officials in the government. When lawmakers decide uh, on um, how to distribute resources or when talking about countries that will have a roadmap who will who will take care of that decision making will it be the ministry of the environment right if we don't organize our public sector we will fail and when i talked about governance i also talk about technology i mentioned that chile is a very long and narrow country and therefore has very important inverse logistic challenges that are barriers for the implementation of circular economy. And therefore, promoting new technology to, to close those gaps is very relevant. Closing loops locally is very important. That means, that for example, in a region in the south of Chile, we had a company that took care of glass glass making that company 
stop working in that region in the southern part of, Re of Chile because because it was not profitable for them to bring all those glass resources to Santiago where most industries are. So when we talk about a circular economy, and also when we talk about the rep law, extended responsibility to the consumer, we definitely have infrastructure deficit. We're lacking the technology that would allow us to close the loops or the cycles locally. That means having companies that design, companies that recover, companies that re recycle, both locally and regionally. We have other challenges like taking care of the environment or how to foster a regenerative agriculture. I think I mentioned that 70% of Chile's water consumption is by the agriculture sector, also mining. They're all working in uh, salt removal plants. There's definitely uh, efforts being made to try to be able to use ocean water for these processes. But we need to return water back to the rivers for natural cycles to be able to run naturally so that ecosystems can work properly. So, as I mentioned, there are spaces uh, in the public sector and governance, education, environment and recovery of materials and talking about agricultural um, economy. Also, I would like to mention another topic that I already mentioned earlier about how to make uh, industrial symbiosis a reality as well. I would like to highlight that yet again. Achieving industrial symbiosis for a country that has our geographical um, conditions is very relevant for job creation. Something that you mentioned that uh, stuck with me, that you mentioned at the beginning, was empathy. In a way, we've lost our ability to empathize with others to empathize with our planet, to empathize with our ecosystem. Yes, especially to empathize with your fellow human friend. As a very illustrious uh, biologist called Maturana says, he says, loving is looking at somebody else as as another human, even when you disagree with him. I believe that's fundamental. Also, the technological development has brought us to a point where we really were separated from ourselves in a way, and we lost empathy for ourselves, for our body. We're disembodied, and empathy for others has lost, been lost as well. Yeah, but... Also, we, we don't feel sorry for the earth, for water, for air. In a way, we've created a digital avatar and we, avatar, and we have decoupled ourselves from reality. So, also, we need, therefore, we need to reconnect with natural resources, but also, as I mentioned earlier, with other citizens. So that's also a challenge, connecting with others that we need to face. In circular economy with its principles targeted towards nature is definitely the way forward. I'm educating my entire family in circular education. We're all talking about it, even my parents they don't understand why I don't have a car. It, their ambitions back in the day, as Silvia Rega used to say, your car, your house. 
as I mentioned, that that uh, paradigm, uh, that ambition is changing. I don't want to have a car because I want to reduce my CO2 emission footprint. Basically, I had to travel here in a plane, so I need to offset that footprint by not having a car. But you're very good. I mean, you're under the average footprint by living in Chile. Everything is connected. I think there is an important element that you now already mentioned. I'd like to emphasize on it. It is metrics, indicators. We need to be able to measure our progress. Some of that has to do with improving livelihood, life quality. About 12 years ago, when I started researching this topic more deeply, I read about a conference that was held in this same place by Thomas Freeman. He had written a book uh, called the, the, the Earth is Flat, Warm, and Disorderly. Hot refers to climate uh, climate change. Flat refers to the fact that things happen more quickly. I, I can connect, for example, today in real time with somebody at the other side of the earth. So things are going faster. And that tends to be more so as time goes by. And it's very important to understand this because that makes humans more... Uh, more demanding on natural resources so there's population growth there's more technology and conversations and agreements are happen faster everything happens faster and therefore we also consume resources faster and uh, disorderly means that we are growing too fast there's too many people so when the population from india china and africa the three added together, start demanding more energy consumption that they have right now, what is going to happen to the world? We're going to collapse. Our energy networks won't be able to answer the demand. That's where we realize the gaps that are there. Europeans already provided that services for the population. India has the right to offer that service to the population. So. How are we going to do it? India is asking Europe to help them understand how to do it. How are we going to do it? There are no agreements. If I compare the improvements that we've managed to achieve from 20 years to today, not so much. ONU recently published information where they say that the, all indicators of climate change are not improving. We're not really being able to change the curve in climate change. There's clearly uh, a gap in governance that hasn't been solved. We're also talking about models that need to improve life quality of people. Chinese, China had a model that privileged uh, population growth and the economy. But when they realized they were destroying their ecosystem, and everyone see, you know, you, you can, You've all, we've all seen pictures on the internet of people covering their mouth with, uh, with gas masks and uh, basically... So metrics and governance, there are two things that we need to work on. And perhaps standard might include those. And I need to be able to find a central topic uh, on, on this whole, uh, what's, the, what's the main goal? Is it sustainability? Is it metrics? I would say that the center has to be humans. And when I place a human in the epicenter, many other things fall into place. I start thinking about the quality of life of, of humans and then the quality of the ecosystems that surround the human and financial growth stops being that important. We won't be able to think about financial growth without affecting the ecosystem. So I would say the world has not solved those two things, the metrics or the governance. And for governments around the world, that's a huge challenge. I actually have a question. Well, for, first I would like to complement what Carla mentioned. 
I think that we need to change the way we think about this. Put ourselves in an epicenter and believe that we are the owners of the Earth. It is our responsibility to take care of it. Because we are more evolved, intelligent animals, we might think that the, the planet has to work for us. I believe that we need to go back to the basics and put the planet in the center, realize that thinking that the, the planet is there to serve us is the cause of many of the problems in ecology. I believe that we need to serve the Earth. I'm as important as the lion out there in the jungle. We need to stop uh, being so e egotistic. Something resounded in my mind that you mentioned, Carlos, that I would like to uh, explore a little bit more. So, talking about human education and about uh, knowing yourself as part of understanding the secret model. Does that mean that, uh, how do you understand that circularity? I, I, that means that whatever you learn out there, you incorporate in yourself. This is what I mean. Understanding circular economy and how to use raw materials, manufacturing methods, how to adjust our way of doing things has to do with feedback. And we're not very good. We're very talented in using the feedback that comes from ourselves. Nor are we good in using feedback that comes from situations or other people. The feedback is one of the building blocks of learning and growth and education, mental growth, physical growth, emotional growth. And the extrinsic learning is kind of like the linear way in which we want to train kids today. It's good to some extent, up to a point, Our education definitely does not teach us how to benefit from the feedback loops that we are surrounded with. Instead, we're just kind of placed into a position where we need to receive information, munch information, and there are examinations in place to be able to measure or assess how much information have we been able to memorize. But life works differently. It's not just about acquiring knowledge. It's not just about it's also reflecting upon what's the result of your actions, what's your effect on the world. How does what I do and what I say have an impact on the people surrounding me and the ecosystem? That, in a way, is a circular model and feedback. I think I, under I understand you when you mention that the educational model is linear. I think you mean that we have an educational model that's very outdated, that teaches us to, te to act in accordance with the linear economic model that we have. New generations are realizing that that's a, f that's a failed model that's uh, bringing us closer to uh, extinction. However, we're still teaching our kids with that linear model. And that's a model that's very, very slow in teaching about f feedback. For example, let's think about industrial engineering. If I, when I start that uh, undergraduate program, and they teach me the linear principles, and then when I grow up and I graduate and then I have to rethink and learn about circular economy, it's very hard for me to unlearn. So maybe having a 
circular economy as part of the curriculum is very important. So, so today, I might be hearing about new tendencies. If we link circular economy early on in educational programs, it, it will be much better. That's why there's a, a challenge in academia. Yes, we need to train our human capital. One of the main fundamental pillars or the core tenets in this transition is for these new value proposals require to have people that have a different lens. And that they so might use all of this circularity and the principles that might help us abide by and comply with the environment and the regenerative uh, principle cycle design and all elements that bring with it that circular economy bring with it so in closing I could tell you that indeed this is a road we must walk in so we don't extinguish ourselves uh, as soon as a species it is a lever that leverages development in the planet in an innovative and collaborative way that brings environmental, social, and economical benefits. Because the ending of economical of natural resources and transaction costs will make it will make of circular economy each time more important. Whoever hits first hits twice. So this is a call from also for companies to join this challenge and governments as well in a real way. Supporting with norms and incentives and promoting governance. Thank you very much. We're done. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything you have shared. Everything you've shared with us, with those who are watching us via internet, online. I believe we have a plan to follow and to continue developing this model of circular economy. And with your suggestions, with what you've contributed to the conversation, I believe we can close it for today. I hope you are connected and that we are interconnected to continue talking, discussing, contributing to the conversation. To learn. To learn from our experiences within the Chilean and Colombian environment in order to rise it to the, to the level as a team. We agree. Thank you very much. <laughs>